Okay, I will. Um, I was uh, sort of uh, re review what I did last time, especially towards the end of last uh, uh, last talk. So I have uh, the notion of a type two one factor. So this, um, so this is a so what this is is a, this is a phonolemic algebra, so infinite dimensional uh, phonolemic algebra. Um, in fact, it's a factor. Factor means that the factor means that the center is trivial, and uh, uh, together with a trace. So there is a trace on on on, on M. So the most important property of this trace is that trace of x y is the same as trace y x, okay. and that's the, that's sort of the reason for. Uh, for this to be called a trace. Okay. Now, uh, one thing uh, I also men mentioned last time why this trace is interesting is because of so-called continuous geometry. So uh, this means that if you take take a trace of a projection P, P is a projection in this online algebra, then this set is actually the closed interval zero and one. Okay, so that's sort of um, one interest for, and in fact, why, why this is called continuous geometry. So if you think of tracing the fine dimensional space as a measure, the dimension or the normalized dimension of the uh, of the space that project, project to, then here the dimension of the space or the normalized dimension of the space is, um, is continuous, okay? All right, so now, um, so uh, since um, since I so I, I want to talk about the sub factors, so so uh, it makes sense to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the representation theory of um, of two one factors. So um, M. So if you, I will write in general terms, but you can think of. This M is the example we discussed last time. It's the L for a discrete group, uh, or LF two. Okay. So, what are the representation theory of two one factor? So, this is an algebra. So, we're talking about is representation. So, this simply means. So, let's say. Uh, so, we say uh, H, a Hilbert space, is a left uh, M module. If uh, there is an action well strictly speaking it has to be weakly continuous but let's not worry about that so there is an action of m on the hill space on the left okay so um, what it says is that this means that for any psi in the hill space uh, m in an element in m there is an action m acting on psi it's also an element in Hilbert space, and this is a this action is you know is a homomorphism. So, so for instance, m1 m2 act on psi is the same as m1 act on m2 act on psi, and so forth. Okay, so this is um, you know this is like in the case of group, this would be representation of a group, but now we have an algebra, so this is like the uh, the action of the algebra. Okay. Okay. So this is a rather formal definition, but what I have actually have, have in mind is is the following. So let's look at the example right away. So M is a left M module, right? Because if you if you if you take any well, at least if you take an element M, M one in M, uh, M in M, then the action of M one on M is simply the product. Right, that's that's pretty straightforward. So I'm actually cheating a little bit here because this M, even though it's a vector space, it might not be a Hilbert space, right? In the, by definition over there, I require this to be a Hilbert space. But in general, M itself might not be a Hilbert space. But um, so um, more precisely, uh, it should be some completion of M. Of M 
to make them into Hubble space. So this is what's known as a GNS, for instance. You can use, use the, one, the trace on M to complete it to Hubble space. Question. I have a question. So yeah. Yeah. even though you, you, know, you want this H to be a Hilbert space, but in the definition, you are not really using it. In the sense, you know, I would guess if you have elements like an invertible, you want the action to be unitary or something, but you didn't require the representation to be any unitary, right? No, no, because M is only an algebra, right? When we talk about group representation, maybe we want it to be unitary, but uh, this is an algebra. So it's just a, you know, action of the algebra. The, but then well, you the, don't see, you know, really the Hilbert structure yes, is yes, using any that's, essential that's way. A good, that's a good question. Yes, I haven't, I haven't used it I, I, and I will not use it in, 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 this, in, this, in this course. So, um, but, but uh, the completion in, in some cases is important. Okay. okay. Not, not, uh, um, yeah. So, yeah, but, uh, yeah. So, yeah, Hilbert space is uh, one of the best uh, boundary space around. But anyway, yeah. So I'm not going to use it. So that's mm -hmm. why you know that's why uh, here I'm just thinking of M as a left M module, right? But if you want to really use my definition, you really have to complete M. In mm -hmm. that case, you can use a state. Uh, in this case, we have a distinguished state, which is the trace. So if you use GNS, you can complete M. So, so this is loosely speaking, but I just want to give you a feeling what these modules basically are. Okay. Okay. So, but I think this probably you went to be very subtle. You know, it's not obvious like there's only you know one good completion or something, right? You know, there's some subtlety, but probably there is a wall, only one completion. Yeah. But yes, in, in, many. yes, yes, yes. In in the two one factor case, the 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 completion is with 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 respect to this trace. So that's mm -hmm. the what's called a standard representation yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay okay Good. all right so so we have a left module right here this is uh example one now the second example um it's uh it's sort of a generalization of previous one so if i take p a trace ah sorry a, a projection in m then mp is also a left M module. Okay, this is sort of also clear, right? Because if you have any element MP like this, so this means an element in M times P, and if you multiply on the left by an element here, this is still in MP, right? Okay, so that's that's another module. Okay, and of course uh, the previous one, so the example one, so example one is the case one this p is just one right so it's slightly more more general um version of projection p okay now once you have this uh you can take direct sum so if you have p1 let's say p1 pn projections in m and then we can take direct sum so mp1 direct sum direct sum mpn this would be also a left m module and we just take the action on the left, okay? Now, the reason I'm giving you this example is because uh, this is the whole list of examples. So here's, here's an interesting result using the trace. So here's, um, here's what I'm going to define. So, um, so for, for a left module like this, we define what's called the dimension of, um, as a left module. So if I take direct sum of this, You, you already see what the proper definition is. I'm just going to take the sum of the traces. Okay, so this is the definition. Okay, so, um, so this is more, this is just a little bit like um, the dimensional vector space, right? So if you, if you have a vector space, so if you have C vector space, then you can define the dimension of a vector space. Okay, so this is similar. Uh, find dimensional case, for instance. Now we're, we're in infinite dimensional situation. Remember this M is, is infinite dimensional. For instance, M is LF2, that's a huge algebra. And we have a left module and we can still talk about the dimension, okay? So uh, the dimension is defined using the trace, okay? So remember this trace is sort of like a normalized dimension, right? See continuous geometry here. 
trace P is a normalized dimension is between zero and one. Anyway, so uh, what's nice about this definition is that the representation theory of two one factor is just like vector space. The only invariant is this dimension. So here's a, here's a fact. Suppose, uh, let's say H1, H2 are two uh, left and module, then M1, oh sorry, H1 is isomorphic as H2. By this, I mean as left and module, so let's write it like this. So this means that there's a unitary map between from H1 to H2, which commutes with the left action of M or intertwines the left action of M, given only if dimension is the same. Okay. So, Excuse so me, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the pre actually, in the previous one, you have a P1 to PN. Yes. Projection. But yes. there's an issue, maybe the P1, P2 are not independent. They may not be orthogonal. And That's correct. So whether there's a condition, so this P1, P2 is orthogonal. So this dimension just sum. Uh, uh, if you yes, you're absolutely right. That that's provided this sum is is the sum you do in in M. But I'm actually doing the direct sum. Do you see that direct sum? So I'm 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 thinking of this as a orthogonal to each other. Okay, but uh, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, but that depends on how you choose this projector. If you choose projector, some arbitrary projector, say P1, P2, they may, may the projection may not be orthogonal. So when you're absolutely there, right, yes. So P1, P2 are not orthogonal in M, right? But when I write like this, I'm actually, so, so if you think of this as leaving in M direct sum, direct sum with M, right? This is leaving in this space. So okay. they automatically orthogonal, yes. I'm, so if oh, you think I, of, I, put them I, on the diagonal. Okay, okay. Yeah, so just yeah. you yeah. the whole thing, I'm sorry, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I make them orthogonal, so I put them okay. on the diagonal. Yes. Okay. Yes, you're absolutely right. If if I would just not not doing direct sum, if I just do the sum here, of course, this is not this is okay. EO defined. As you observed, P one, P two must this must be orthogonal to each other for this to make sense. But I I, I do this uh, manually, so yeah. So and for, another thing is that uh, these uh, results, these uh, only dimension is the invariance. It's uh, very surprising. Because yes. I can't imagine this two one factor may depend on this group. Uh, uh, so you have L S two, so maybe you have the S two yeah. group. If you have a different, yeah. this should have a different story. But first of all, this group does not appear here. It does not appear. Here. That's that's true. That's true. Yes. So once you so this is really just purely depend on phenomenal algebra now, right? It doesn't there's no group anymore. So yeah. So yeah. So so because you know. I mean, group is embedded into this, but you know, uh, but then you know, once you take this uh, this particular completion, somehow the information about the group is is lost. So, so for instance, uh, maybe here's a result which which is in that spirit. So, if you have two, so let's say if um, if two groups G1, G2, are minimal, then as two one factor LG1 is isomorphic to LG2. So, so when you when you take the group phenomenon algebra completion, a lot of structures about groups are lost. Okay, so only the, you know, so so there there are a lot of uh, minimal groups which are not isomorphic as group, but as a phenomenon algebra, they're all the same. Okay, so maybe let me try to understand. Suppose G is a finite group. Yeah, pretty maybe that's a pretty trivial case. Is that true uh, that this dimension all became a one then? Yes, if G is a finite group, let's let's do that. If G is yeah. a finite group, yeah. If G is a finite group, then L G is never a factor unless G is trivial, right? Yeah, I see. It's not a factor unless G is trivial. So yeah, there's no contradiction oh, there. Oh, yeah. Okay. So here we with we, we, the, the the fact that we require M to be a factor is very important. Oh, otherwise, okay, okay. otherwise you. Yeah, otherwise it certainly is not true. You you would have, there is some, you know, there is further information you require about the center of M. But okay. if if you, yeah, so here, I think I start with very beginning is two one factor. So we, we assume that this is a factor. Yeah, yes, you're absolutely right. Otherwise, you know, of course we know the representation of finite group is, is a very interesting story and certainly not uniquely determined by its dimension. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 
Thank you. So, so Fo, just a yeah. quick knowledge question. So, are yeah. finite groups amenable? I'm, I'm sorry, what's that? Are finite groups amenable? Yes, yes, all compact groups are amenable. Yes. Okay, then, so when you say they are the same, you probably mean if G1, G2 are amenable and infinite. Yes, 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 ICC, yes, yes, sorry, sorry. Okay. I always talk about five. So, so yeah, LG is a, is a, is a, is a factor if and only if uh, G is ICC group. So these are groups okay. with infinite yes, conjugate yeah, yeah. okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. So, so for instance, yeah. yeah. So one such a minimal group you can take is take what's called S infinity. So just take the union of symmetric group on N letters, you know, this, this, this is a minimal group. Okay, so it's a minimal. Well, then they are all the hyperfinite factor then, right? Yes, yes, this is a hyperfinite factor, yes. <laughs> so uh, this LS infinity is uh, hyperfinite. You can see why that is, okay? okay so the hyperfinite means that you can find a sequence of um, uh, finite dimensional increase in sequence, finite dimensional algebras, let's say Mn inside uh, this M, such that if you take the union of Mn and take, remember the weak topology, this is the whole thing. So since Zheng Han mentioned that, I just defined the notion of hyperfinite. So this is the, uh, the closest, uh, you know, infinite dimension algebra, I mean, the closest in the sense to the fine dimension algebra. So you can find increase in sequence fine dimension algebra, which approximate every element M um, weak topology. And in fact, in, in this case, you can see already, right? So you just, what you take, you just take the algebra associated with Sn, but Sn is a finite group, so that algebra is fine dimensional. You just take uh, LSN, and this is an increase in sequence that would approximate LSS infinity. Each one of them is fine dimensional. Okay. Anyway, so this, yeah, these are um, hyperfinite, right? Okay, so um, yeah, so, so let's go back to this module definition because I want to use this to define what's called the index. Okay, so, so let's, let's look at this. So, so I, I hope this, this uh, you know, this thing uh, makes, makes the trace and two in fact a very interesting object, right? Even though it's infinite dimensional, but it's representation theory, it's just like finite dimensional vector space, right? We know that finite dimensional from linear algebra that two vector space uh, isomorphic if and only if the dimension is the same. And we now have similar result, right? This, this fact here shows that it's, I mean, even though we're dealing with infinite dimensional objects, but they, they behave very nicely, just like fine dimensional vector spaces, okay? All right, so, so now I want to go to sub-factor because, this <coughs> one. okay, so let's define what's a sub-factor. So I have M this factor here. So what's a sub-factor is really what you think it is. So let's make this a definition. So a uh, sub-factor is a pair, N in M. M is a factor uh, where N is also a factor. Okay. So, um, so maybe, maybe an example, let's, let's, let's get an example right away. Remember that M equal to LF2 this, uh, you know, this huge um, two n factor coming from the left direct representation of the free group. Well, how do I get a sub factor? Interesting one, especially. Remember, uh, free group on three generators lies in free group in two generators. In fact, you can, you can embed any free group on any generator into F2. So you just take LF3, it's also, it's embedded in LF2. So that's, that's a, that's a sub-factor. So here's the sub-factor. So in other words, in general, if you have H and G, let's say uh, both ICC groups, then LH is containing LG, right? So there are lots of examples. Examples of sub-factors, okay? So um, maybe I, um, yeah, I will write a definition right away. So, um, we define, so let's, let's write. Yeah. Maybe, yes. You know, so I'm a little confused. So this, why F3 belong to F2? I thought it the other way around. 
because F3 is the word ah. for three letters. Very good, oh, very good. Only word for two letters. Yeah, so A, B. So let's, let's, let's do example. I forgot my, my memory on this is, there's a canonical index two subgroup of F2, which is F3. I think the best way to look at this is probably look at the fundamental group, but let's just cook up something. So I will just have to have uh, free, uh, well, A, B, A inverse. Um, yeah, so I, I guess it's very easy. So A, so A, A, B, oh, no, no, no. Um, what is it? A, B, A inverse. Um, B, A, B inverse. What's the other one? Um, oh, I see. Yeah, so because you can, you can make them, you see, you can make them, uh, have no re because AB has no relations, right? Okay, okay. So even though you write you write a word like this, it has no relation to this one. And then what's the, what's the next one? Of F3. Okay. Yeah. So so maybe maybe even a square uh, b a minus two. Yeah. Yeah. Because this has no relation, they cannot cancel out. You know. So yeah. In fact, any okay. free group, you know, is 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 bad in F two. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, yeah, this, I, I don't believe what I've written down is the canonical one. The, okay. the, there's a canonical one which has index two. So anyway, yeah. But, but okay. can also say F2 belongs to F3 because that's- Yes, F3. absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my so, goodness. Yeah, okay. this, is a, this may be a different F3, right? So this will be okay. AC. Yes, yes. So they are, yeah, this will not happen for, for finding groups, okay. right? <laughs> yeah. Oh okay. Remove okay. your guilty biology. It's completely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a different group, so maybe I'll put a hat there. <laughs> anyway, so let's see. Uh, yeah. So I want, to, I want to get this index right out of the way because um, there, there is a question about this last time. So, so what is the index? So the index is really, so, so notice that if I have N in M, this is a sub vector. Uh, note, the very simple position is that um, M is a left N module, right? Because, every element in N X on M still belongs to M, okay? Okay, I, I guess I, I, I forgot to say that we, we are obviously interested in, uh, in the case when N is infinite dimensional, so we, we're interested in uh, N is also a two one factor here. Otherwise, it's not terribly interesting, okay? It's just some matrix algebra, if, so it's fine dimensional. So, so we, so n here is, a, is also two one factor. So therefore we can, we can use, um, remember this dimension we defined before? So the index of um, this sub factor, uh, usually denoted by, so this is like the group notation. This is just the dimension of uh, M as a left M module, okay? So that's the, uh, that's the definition of, uh, of index, okay? So, so in other words, this is a dimensional-like quantity, right? As the name suggests, okay? And it's very much like the dimension, I mean, I shouldn't say it's very much like the dimension of vector space, but, but uh, at least uh, this fact here shows that it looks um, a bit like the dimension of the vector space, right? So let me move this up a little bit. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll comment more on this dimension here, okay? So, so, so remarks, why this is interesting quantity. The first thing to observe is- A question yeah. before you say why is interesting. So yeah. back to the definition. So we assume, uh, a or M are two one factor, or it doesn't matter. Yeah, yes, yes, it doesn't matter. It, uh, uh, I'm just for continuity uh, with last week's lecture. I was I will uh, start with two one factor, but this is completely general. So but in general, two one, you know, if M is a two one factor, it's not guaranteed a sub factor is always two one, right? Yeah, it's, it's always because uh, if it's, oh, it's always the dimension of big, yeah, because the trace restrict the trace on n. Right? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So the definition is that the trace here, but this, this is sub algebra, so this restrict the trace on n. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I explain this uh, dimension n m, little more in more detail. 
because yeah. uh, this uh, this is very true compact so the track. Uh, okay. So is this a dimension you calculate in M or you calculate in N? You know this. Uh, uh, oh, this is a projection. I'm a little confused. With this uh, this dimension. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So so um, yeah. So so let's 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 see how we count this M. Right. So M is a left end module. So first thing to observe is that this dimension is at least one. Right. Because so so M contains N. So so let's see. So first of all, N is inside here, right? Yes. And and, and so so there is a copy of N as a left end module inside. Okay. Inside here, right? So at least one copy of N is inside M. But now you know what about the others other than this N, right? So so we know the dimension is always greater or equal to one because there is a copy of N inside M. I okay. See. And 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 uh, let's let's actually yeah let's um, yeah. let me well, let, let me, me let me just uh, say so yeah uh, so, so dimension of uh, n in n is a one that's a that's yes a yes yes as I it should be. yes yes dimension yeah. so, of so n. this dimension just say because m is a m bigger one so it's yeah. a bigger one so maybe several copy and uh, something okay no 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 yes, yes very good yes that's what that's I actually normalization is the normalization is after the n in n just a just normalize the dimension to be one. That's a yes, definition. yes. So this is this is like when you have your uh, okay. complex vector space, you you have the dimension of C as the left C module is equal to one. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. So so in other words, let's let's actually look at the fact again. Okay. So uh, I want to move. Yeah, this fact yeah. here. So maybe this is an important fact. I just I just taught okay. calculus to, uh, yesterday. So <laughs> this is what I do to my. Uh, <laughs> students put a red circle there. So this means uh, this is an important uh, fact. So if you have two left M module, uh, they are isomorphic as a left M module if and only if the dimension is the same, right? So, so, so let's suppose, um, so let's suppose, uh, uh, yeah, so let's suppose, uh, so maybe I should do this instead. Otherwise, it's uh, so three remarks here. So the first thing I want to remark is that um, if you have let's use n the two one factor over here. So the dimension of n, uh, you know, if you take it, so left uh, n module, right? So I claim the first remark is that this this number can take any value in zero to infinity, okay? Let's, let me argue why that's the case, okay? Of course, if you take H to be equal to, so, so let's say, uh, let's say uh, this number is, uh, is, um, um, is theta, okay? All right, so if you take any theta here, theta, I, I, I can write this as a, this is a positive integer, non-negative integer, plus, um, Maybe a little piece. I forgot. I don't have the best notation. So x. So x here is between. Let's say between zero and one. Okay. Let's say say that is like this. I can cook up a left end module with this dimension easily. How do I do that? Remember continuous geometry. I can take. I can find projection p n so that trace of p is this uh, fractional part x. Right. That's because of continuous geometry. And then I just cook the module, which is just uh, n direct sum with itself n times. This n can be infinity, and then the the, the small piece, m p here, right? And then you can see that the dimension of this edge as a left n module is n plus trace of p. Trace of p is by by our choice equal to x, so this is m plus x, this is equal to theta, okay? So this is the first observation. If you just look at the dimension of the left um, m module, it can take any positive or non-negative value, right? By simply using the fact that uh, we have this continuous geometry property, the trace of projection at two one factor can take any value between zero and one, okay? So this makes sense, right? This is the first remark. The second remark is that, well, I guess the second remark is, is a theorem now. 
So, so in other words, this, what, what this M, back to the question Xiao Gang asked before, so what this M looks like, so N in some sense, so if, maybe I'll make a comment here. So if this index is equal to this theta, for instance, then N as a left N module is isomorphic to, to this to n direct sum with n, n times plus np, right? So this is what uh, this index is telling you. So how many copies of n you need to fill up m, but not quite exact, right? Because we are in the continuous geometry situation, there's like a, not a whole part, you know, it's a small portion of this, right? Part of it, if you think, because you have this projection here. So there's this little piece here. So this is what this index is telling you, right? Is a dimension like quantity? People sometimes say that, you know, this is uh, like, you know, uh, like the dimension of vector space. So that in, indeed, it, it is the dimension of a left end module, okay? So as such, it's not terribly interesting because this is basically just a dimension, but of course we have this modular part that we have continuous geometry part. In other words, the dimension of, um, left end module cannot take any values between zero and infinity. For instance, you can take, so theta can be equal to pi, right? Which of course uh, will not happen for vector spaces. Vector spaces, the dimension is always uh, non-negative integers. So that's slightly different. But other than that, um, doesn't seem to be much um, more than that. But so this is where the surprise comes in. This, the, so, the second remark is, is, the, is the following theorem. So this is the famous theorem to Devon Jones, um, who very sadly passed away just last month. Um, so, uh, so this is, uh, let's see, which year would that be? I think it's published in 80, 83, um, but um, probably before that the theorem is already there. So he's uh, the first, uh, important theorem in this field about subfactor is that um, so the index m n um, can and oh can only be the following set. Okay, so there is a discrete part. This is positive integer, a union is for infinity, okay? So this is the, the first major uh, theorem in the subject um, because why, why this is so surprising? Well, I guess the continuous part is not so surprising, but if you look at this part here, um, what, what is this discrete set? So maybe I'll draw a picture of this discrete set. So the first value is when k equal to three, that's when it's equal to one. So this is one here. And the next value is two. And then, and then the golden ratio, and then three. And then, uh, and then, and then you get to, um, get to four, okay? So in particular, between one and two, uh, there's no, uh, no value here. So in other words, there's a gap, right? There's a lot of gap between one and four. It takes a discrete set, okay? Now, uh, I want to uh, sort of, for those of you who have never seen this before, I want to convince you this is a, uh, you know, um, this is such a surprising result, okay? You see, um, because the way the index is defined is a, is a, uh, the dimension of M as a left end module. And because the remark I said here, if you just take a, any left end module, its dimension can take any value, right? From this, because M contains a copy of N, you, we can only conclude that it's greater or equal to one. But what this theorem is saying that is that, you know, if the index is less than four, it takes a discrete set, okay? So what's going on? Okay. Why is this dimension of M as a left end module has to be discrete? So where does this restriction come from? Okay, well, the short answer is, so let me write down the answer here. The answer is that M is not just a left end module. M is also 
and the algebra. Okay, so this is what's important here. Okay, notice here that you know when we define the dimension of left end module, we only make reference to the fact that this is a vector space, right, or Hilbert space. You see, that's that's how in fact that's how we construct this. You see, if you do this construction here, we just take direct sum of n copies of n, and then we direct sum with an, a small piece here in p, right? This is not guaranteed to be algebra, but it's guaranteed to be a vector space. We take direct sum of vector spaces. Okay, so the the non-trivial constraint comes in because, or um, or m is not just just the you know, just a vector space, it's also an algebra, it's a von Neumann algebra, it has algebraic structure. Okay, so this algebraic structure is what makes, uh, makes the dimension of M as a left end module, um, you know, satisfy more constraints. So, for instance, if you, if you take Jones theorem, so let's, let's see a consequence, what I just said here. So, um, for example, let's take, uh, let's take a number Let's take uh, pi, right? So let's uh, suppose, suppose h um, dimension of nh is equal to pi, okay? And it's easy to see that the pi is not in the list in the Bob's theorem. So what Jones theorem is telling us is that then h can never be made into a two one factor containing n. So this is what the theorem says, right? So you can easily cook up left end module which has dimension equal to pi, 3.14 and so forth, right? But, you know, so how do you cook up this? Well, pi is 3.14, so what you do is you just pick n equal to three and pick this p to be pi minus three, right? The trace of p. So you can make your left end module no problem, okay, easily. Direct sum and, you know, just put a small projection there. But what this theorem is telling us is that, well, you can do that, but you can never make this into, I mean, this is perfect well-defined Hilbert space, you can complete it. But what we're saying here is that it can never be made into a two-one factor containing it. Because if it, if it does, then this dimension has to be in this list but the pi is not in the list, okay? Since pi is not in the above list. Okay, so this is the point. Um, yeah. So here, let me ask a question. So this uh, yes. NP can indeed take value from zero to one, right? You can always yes. choose the projection. So yes. NP really, uh, uh, the dimension of NP are free from zero to one, okay. Yes, yes. And also yes. Uh, maybe, it goes for this for for the for for somehow uh, Eric is that so this uh, uh, this sub factor is that square root of the sub sub factor is a dimension is a is a possible quantum dimension of a fusion category. Yes, yes. It's the square. It's the square of the quantum dimension. Yes, yes. Oh yeah, so, yes. So, 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 yeah. so all the uh, quantum dimension of a quantum dimension of a fusion category uh, in this list. It's I yes, think. Yes. Yes. Yes, so quantum dimension people use in, uh, in yes, I, I, I probably, yeah, I'll probably uh, say, I think most people here, are, uh, you know, I think the uh, in, in no modular tensor category very well. So yeah, yeah I'll uh, probably switch um, later to this, but okay. but yeah, just the quantum dimension is the square root of, it, of, uh, of this index. So in this case, it would be, uh, the least would be um, two cosine pi over k. Yeah. Good, equal to three union with two to infinity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, yeah. So compare with the, what people usually uh, do in this module. Is kinda, this is really amazing because uh, the quantum dimension coming in from fusion category have very different background, and this is a sub factor. It's a seems totally different thing, and they are somehow related. exactly amazing. exactly yeah. That's that's, that's yeah. That's why you know this thing brings a lot of people together. <laughs> Like, I mean, people like Richard, uh, you know, I, I, you know, and, you know, so, yeah. So I think, you know, um, you know, we approach uh, modular tensor category from very different uh, starting point. Yeah. So, yeah. So for instance, I get to know Richard's work because of the, you know, connection with sub factors, so forth. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, 
Yeah, so so I guess I, I hope I'm making my point here. So because M is an algebra, right? So that's the, this is how the theorem is proved. It's very, it's crucial that the algebraic structure of this 2M factor, both 2M factors are used in the proof. Um, it has to be because, you know, if, if you just think of this as a left module, then you can take any value. So the theorem wouldn't be valid, okay? Um, so I want to, um, so, so let's see, uh, what do I want to do? Um, yeah, so maybe I, 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 I say a few words about the slogan here, you know. Um, so the usual slogan, so what's subfactor theory? Okay, so what, what is subfactor theory? So depending on your taste, um, some people think of this as, a, a, so let's, let's, let me just comment on. So non, this is a non-commutative Gower theory. Some people think in this way, okay? So maybe I will say a few words about this before I move on to the next uh, thing here. Um, so, so, um, so if you, if you, uh, if you study Gower theory, then you have, um, you have um, fields, right? So uh, in Gower theory, you have uh, maybe, a, uh, what do you, so F1, F2, uh, I have used F, so maybe uh, field, um, yeah, so, um, so, so let's see, uh, well, Q1, Q2, okay, so these are fields, right? Let's say over C, okay, for simplicity, right? So in, in Gawa theory, we start, so, but fields, remember, this is a commutative algebra, right? And in, in, in Gawa theory, we start, we study uh, pairs of commutative algebra like this. We study, um, you know, uh, the relation uh, of, you know, for instance, in this case, uh, the dimension of um, Q2 as a left Q1 module would be the, the, the degree of the extension. So we think of Q2 as extension of Q1. We have similar dimension here. Uh, it's commutative algebra, but this Gower theory itself is extremely rich, right? Uh, um, you know, there, you know, lots of generalization afterwards, okay? But why, why uh, people say, that subfactor is like non-commutative geometry. Well, so subfactor is sort of the study, the position of the smaller factor inside a bigger one, right? Sort of the position here, the relative the position of small one inside a bigger one. There's also a dimension like quantity, which is this index. The index, by the way, behaves very <clears throat> much like, like the, the, the dimension here, okay? Uh, behaves, so behaves just like dimension. Now, um, why this is non-commutative? Remember, both N and M are factors. So the center of M, N and M are trivial. So these are highly non-commutative objects, okay? It's, it's not like in the case of fields, um, these are commutative things. Okay? And of course, uh, another thing is that they're purely infinite dimensional. Okay, so so uh, there, um, you know, some some of the uh, some of the uh, result in Gower theory has has uh, has a mirror image in the subfactor theory. So let me maybe say one thing. Example. So suppose you have G a finite group. Uh, let's say it's uh, X properly on the two one factor M. Properly simply means that just to make sure that the fixed point algebra and the action of, of G uh, is going to be a two one factor. So let's not worry about the technical definition. Just make sure that this sub algebra is actually a factor. So then we got the two one factor. So this is an example of a, a group like sub factor. Uh, the index, not surprisingly, in this case, it's just the, the order of the group G. And there is also something like a Gawa correspondence. So for instance, Gower correspondence says this. If you take P, let's take P, a uh, factor, or simply a phenomenal algebra, sitting in between M, G, and M, then this P is in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, a closed sub, a subgroup of G, so that um, this P is actually the fixed point action and the, um, 
of M and the action of the subgroup. Okay, so this is this is like the Gawa correspondence in a field case, but now you know, in self-active story, you have a very similar story. Okay. In fact, uh, literally all the results from Gawa theory can borrow uh, in this setting as well. Right. But I, I, I'm, it's not quite quite right, but um, you know, roughly. Okay. So for instance, this Gawa correspondence. Um, was I think was even known before before the subfect theory was developed. Um, it was probably uh, due to Japanese school back in the fifties. Anyway, so so um, um, but you know if subfect theory is just like Gawa theory, then this wouldn't be terribly interesting, right? But you, you already see from this theorem, uh, it would not be just like the ordinary Gawa theory because, as you guys observed, this quantum dimension can take two cosine pi over k. And most of the time, this is not an integer in general, okay? Where in Gower theory, the dimension is always, um, is always integer. So, so, so there are lots of interesting, so um, there are lots of interesting sub-factors uh, with, um, index, uh, not integer. Okay, so so that's that's the reason you know people people are very interested in this um, because it's, it's it's just something completely new and, and I guess I I can trace back this um, the fact that you know you, you have more interest in index to the fact that we have continuous geometry here right so that's why I think I spent a substantial part discussing about this. Okay, because now you're in infinite dimensional situation because of this continuous geometry, the index structure is more, certainly more interesting. Okay, all right, so um, yeah. Okay, so so I, think, I have a question here. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I just want to push your philosophy a little bit further. Yeah. So if you, you know, think about this as some version of Galois theory, and we can trace back, you know, what's interesting of Galois theory originally. So that's symmetry, yeah. Use, that's you know to write out solution of a polynomial yes, using radicals. Yes. yes. And I would consider you can push the analogy a little bit further. Yeah. You can consider, you know, there's a non-binary version of a Galois theory, which tells you if you can solve polynomial equations, you know, in this case would be pentagons. So the question I'm really interested, I don't know if there will be a theory, is that I'm always interested in the question, you know, suppose we have a pentagon solution, you know, suppose we have a fusion ring. Yeah. We want to solve the pentagons. And then you can ask the question, what's the possible smallest? You have to define properly number yeah. field that you can write down or, you know, some field to write down the solutions. Uh -huh. I wonder this, you know, Galois theory analogy can eventually lead to a theorem roughly like the real generalization of Galois work, which is if the group have certain property or the index has certain properties, then, then it's related to the smallest number field. You can write down the solution or something. Yeah, that, that I know in the module tensor category, that's an interesting question. But I think I think my my take on this is that you know the classical Gawa theory starts with the symmetry, symmet uh, represent uh, the, you know Gawa's observation about you know the, the the important role played by the symmetry of the group, right? That's the that's how the 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 concept of symmetry or uh, introduced it, you know. Um, so the sub factor language, obviously, because of the example I just discussed here, obviously contains. Uh, the, the the case when the symmetries are described by groups, especially yeah. I mean in this case it's just classical groups, but yeah. it's more general. In this framework, it's more general. So so I think the I think the, the, my way of thinking about this is this is a generalization of the usual classical group symmetry. So this is what people sometimes call quantum symmetry. Well, so this is, what, yeah. what I'm looking for is the thing is you know what Galois theory gives us is that. We get a filtration of a groups. You know, there's a billion group, there are solvable group, near potent group. Yes. But yes. I was hoping you another many interesting, you know, kind of you know, you know, stratification of a finite groups. And I think you know, you guys pick up one notion which is a minimal is important. 
but I'm looking for something, you know, along that line, like, you know, we will further, further give a better study of finite groups, you know, classification, we go beyond solvable, neopotent solvable, and then something finer than amenable. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, anyway, groups are already complicated uh, enough, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I think yeah. it's, I think that's the subject is very early on, so probably this is way down the path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, group is so, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have also a question. Uh, yeah. I try to understand this, uh, this uh, theorem, how this theorem was uh, proved of, of the, the reason I ask this question because uh, we know in the fusion category, the quantum dimension coming from this uh, fusion ring. Yes. You know, have symbol or there's constraint, you know. They, they yes, yes. Here. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so here, you know, how this result was uh, obtained. You, you don't have a fusion, you don't have fusion ring. You don't oh, we do, we do, we do, okay, yes. Yeah. Yes, so, uh, yeah, so it's, so this is not, okay. Yes, yes, so, so let me just comment on that. So, so where's the fusion? Or subfactor. Okay, so, um, so the, the, it, the, I mean, this way, the, the, the one I'm going to describe next was not how this theorem was originally proved, but it's equivalent. So later it was, um, you know, um, yeah, so translated in this way by people like Okiano, for instance. So the, the fusion in, in this case is there, there is a fusion ring coming out of this. So, so for that, we need, a, we need the notion of bimodule. So, so let's, so I will just write the example here. So M itself, I, so far, for index, I only consider the left end module, right? But it's also a right end module, right? Because, you know, you just take elements in N, which acts on M on the left, okay? So this is N N by module, okay? And by module has tensor product. So if you have two by module, let's say M and, and P, and, and you have algebraic tensor product. So, um, so is well defined. Here one has to be a little bit careful, you know, um, so we, we usually take the completion. So let's not worry about that. At least algebraically, you know, if you have by module, you can do tensor product. Okay, so here's the fact. Uh, yeah. Question? Yeah. Okay, so the left module can already have a tensor product. Is that right? Uh, why you need a fine module? Okay, yeah, because when you do tensor product, you need to tensor over something, right? So when you write, yeah. you see, you, you have a tensor here, I have a tensor here. So uh, in order to over something, this M here, you know, two left M by module cannot be tensor product over N. You know, the way you write it on a line, there's a left and there's a right, right? Okay. So, yeah, so when they- so over something is supposed to be, so left for one, right for the other, right? Not yes, so, yes. Like, so you see, okay. when a tensor over N, the ones in the middle sort of can, I mean, is the one, you know, that the structure is over N, but then once you tensor over N, what's the left is a left N module and the right N module, right? Okay. So it's still yes. a, an N by module. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so that's, yeah. So this is, yeah, this is, I guess, intuitively, that's how it's defined. And, and I guess the fact, you know, there's, there's something, you know, going through it. I mean, the, yeah, there, 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 there's, you know, completion and so forth. Uh, but the fact that I want, I want to talk about is that this, this um, if the index is finite, uh, so we have one generator here, right? This is um, just one element, so we can test itself. So this, we generate, generate, uh, let's see, uh, I guess the definition of fusion ring. Um, my, my fusion ring might have infinite many objects. So we generate, uh, uh, well, let's see, a, a star fusion ring. So, so I guess, uh, Richard, this might not be the definition, usual definition of fusion ring, right? The usual definition of fusion ring requires only a fine number of simple objects, is that right? Yeah, in general we do. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I will- Always generate a number of them. Yeah. 
so yeah so let's let's say uh, i guess uh, this is not a this might have infinite many objects so for instance uh, compact groups might have uh, infinite many representations but uh, they, they generate a range right so yeah but under 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 um, condition um, let's see under condition that um, what we call nm finite depths this is the same equivalent okay so something a little bit stronger than the index being finite, then this will generate a fusion ring. Okay, this is literally the, the fusion. Well, since everything comes from von Neumann algebra is, is um, I guess my terminology is not standard. I haven't kept track of um, all the latest uh, technology and terminology. So by this, I mean, it has a star structure. Okay, it has, um, you know, um, the home space has, um, it's actually a Hubble space. Anyway, so, yeah, so so this is this is what you know, I guess modern proof of this theorem would be like. So it would generate fusion ring, and and you look at the tensor product, and if the index is lit, um, if the quantum dimension is less than two, then there's AD classification, and that will lead to the theorem over there. That's the the same proof as in the in the in the um, in the fusion category. Okay, but there's yeah. a fusion ring, the object of the fusion ring. <laughs> This question that this is, you have a fusion ring which have an infinite number of objects, but those objects uh, are simple, so maybe you still have a finite simple object. Yes, yes. Uh, no, the, the, um, yeah, so, so usually if just under the condition that the index is finite, um, this will generate a ring, it's, it's, it's a ring, um, but it might have infinite many simple objects. But if you, if you um, but, but under, uh, for the condition, in fact, equivalent condition, so sometimes you, would, you actually generate uh, only fine number of simple objects. In that okay. case, it's, it's a fusion ring, yes. yes. I see. Yes. So, in that so, way, so, finite, so when you have a finite number of simple objects, that's when the quantum dimension can be discrete. Is this two related? Yes, 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 that's right. Yes, so, so for instance, um, two cosine pi over k in uh, Jung's theorem corresponds to, um, uh, I guess, uh, SU2 at uh, the level k, I think minus two, a fusion ring. Right, so, so. So, yeah. so in the finite in the finite depth case, the the other part from four on up, um, it also gets discretized in some way, or yes, yes. So so yeah, yeah. So in the finite depth case, in the so finite depth case, so finite depth implies that um, so finite depth is equivalent to um, M N N generates a fusion ring. And so, therefore, the index has to be algebraic integer, right? As you know, so um, index is an algebraic integer. Yeah. Um, so, so, what is the unit in this? Ah, uh, the this unit N? is just yeah. The unit is n. You're absolutely right. So, so okay. what's the unit here? The unit is just this, right? Okay. This is the identity element. But, uh, but for this, uh, uh, for this uh, finite depth case, for quantum dimension bigger than two, do we have some kind of a constraint, your know, understanding, rather than just uh, any real number from two to infinity? Ah, okay. That's a good question. So, yes. So, um, so, so Joe's original theorem, so I, I, I guess I didn't quite state it precisely. So what he proved is that first of all, the index has this is restricted to this discrete set, and then he realized every value in this discrete set by some factor, by some two one factor. Okay. okay. So everything here is realized, but um, the uh, the realization in the case when you have uh, index between four and infinity is not terribly interesting. Uh, in that case, uh, the corresponding uh, fusion ring is actually trivial, so it's it's not not terribly interesting. So, but okay. of course, uh, and, and so so yeah so 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 the original theorem doesn't say much about uh, the value uh, here 
okay, between four and infinity. But of course, uh, later on, um, a lot of people have worked on this. So um, let's see, if your question is about what constraints we have, so um, yeah, so maybe, so maybe- uh, Looks like uh, one need to have need additional condition just beyond just a two one factor. And so, so, so then you have a more structure for higher quantum dimension, is that the situation? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, no, the, the fact is finite depth is, 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 is so this finite depth is a, is, a, is a very strong constraint. Okay, okay. Very strong constraint. So in other words, you can only generate a fine number of simple objects. So I guess maybe I'll mention one result in this direction. So, so you see uh, this Jones original theorem is one, uh, two, and then um, I'm, I'm talking about the index here. So this yeah. is four and then infinity, right? Yeah. So, so I think, I think uh, um, later on, uh, people like uh, Scott and, uh, um, and you know, so various combination of Scott and other people. So, so have shown, have pushed this a little bit further. So in the fine depth case, they can push all the way up to five, I think. Mm. Yeah, so there's, a, there's a, once again, discrete set, okay? And up to five, and I think the latest one, I haven't followed the, the latest development yet. So it's, it's a little bit beyond five, okay? And okay. I was told that uh, six is impossible. So beyond six, it seems to be hard. So yeah, so so there's some work here. I see. Yeah. But um, generally, it's a belief that if this fusion ring have a finite depth, then it's a it's an index should be all kind of discrete, not just arbitrary real number. Uh yeah. Uh let's see. Um so the index is always I mean the finite depth case is always an algebraic integer. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It's, yeah, okay. it's always an algebraic integer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Right, so yeah, yeah, so, so this is really a lot of hard work here, you know, um, uh, people have, have worked very hard, and it, but, but one thing I want to point out is that, I mean, since I, I guess, you know, uh, let me check the participant, I think most of you are here are very, uh, very familiar with uh, tensor categories and stuff. So, so soft factor, so one interest, um, or, uh, or one reason there, there's some uh, lots of uh, interactions between soft factor people and uh, and modular tensor category people, I guess Eric can be considered one of one of them, is because um, is because of this connection, right? So 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 I guess one thing we we can say is that, that if you if you can construct new sub factor, new in whatever the sense you have, um, new sub factor, you can. You can get interesting uh, fusion fusion category. Okay, that's because you know because what we have here, you, you have bi modules. Okay, and then this, this bi module would, would immediately give you fusion category. Okay, and and uh, you know um, if you if you want your braiding, just take the double, right? So there are a lot of TQFT out of this. Okay, so. So that's why you know there's a lot of interest in constructing uh, these sub factors, you know, by by uh, use, often by operator algebraic techniques, okay, um, and and uh, frequently you know we do get uh, interesting uh, sub factor uh, new sub factor this way. So maybe maybe um, let's see. Oh, my time is is already over, right? It's eight oh six already. Yeah. Well, okay. you, can, you can continue. No, no, continue. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, so, so maybe, yeah, maybe I, I'll maybe use the last, use 20 more minutes, and, and I just want to finish with uh, at least, uh, you know, what's, um, what are some of these new sub factors and, and uh, how we construct them, and, you know, why, uh, you know, uh, you know, from Kronfeld theory point of view, this, this is, you know, there's a lot of, um, anyway, it's tied up with, uh, with all this, um, CFT stuff. Uh, let me see how do I do this. Um, so there are a lot of new sub factors. Um, yeah. So so there's purely algebraic tech, purely um, uh, operator algebraic um, techniques can be used. Okay. So people like, for instance, Izumi and others, they have constructed uh, lots of uh, sub factors. 
for lots of surfactants. Okay, so but I I want to um, so maybe maybe a distinguished one I guess is probably familiar to this audience is uh, this subfactor five plus Gersuti over two. This is the Hart group. Okay, very interesting subfactor, very exotic. Um, anyway, so at least the double of Hart group leads to some um, uh, modular tensor category. Anyway, so maybe maybe uh, I would just say. Uh, um, See how should I do this? Um, um, so, so from from CFT point of view, um, there's also a lot of subfactors. So, lots of subfactors in uh, quantum field theory, especially in, in conformal field theory. Okay, this is you know sort of actually um, my reason to to study uh, this this subject because you know it's quite quite amazing you might not be a, you might not uh, be aware of it but uh, there's there's abundance of subfactors in in the um, uh, in the um, in the models of uh, CFT so maybe maybe I will just finish with um, with um, a rich source of subfactors so let, let's let's finish the uh, rich source of subfactors from from sort of first principle in in quantum field theory from locality. Okay, so this is what I want to advertise. Uh, this will be my last topic, and hopefully it's also tied up with uh, at least something I said in the abstract. So, so, um, so I guess I have explained what the subfactors are, right? So you have a factor and you have a smaller one, and the theory of subfactors is to study. The location of smaller one inside a bigger one. By the way, I should I should say that you know, um, soft factor is notoriously hard to construct. Okay, uh, I guess most of you know that new fusion categories are notoriously hard to construct, right? So there is a conservation of difficulty there. Okay, um, the reason you can see that why soft factors are hard is that besides the classical case, meaning that you know your soft factor come from some some kind of group symmetry. In general, if you have what we thought of as a, as a quantum symmetry is there's no group around. It's notoriously hard to construct. In fact, you know, one of the major achievement in this theorem is the first construction of subfactor which takes non integer values. Okay. So equivalently, that's like the construction of this fusion category associated with SU2 at this level, right? But before, before the, even the, uh, the, the quantum group was in, invented, you know, uh, Jones has his construction. So this is quite amazing. Um, anyway, so it's notorious hard to construct. So it's, um, it's not every day that you, 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 by some chance, you just have an infinite dimensional uh, algebra and then it contains another interesting infinite dimensional subalgebra, right? So it's, it's um, yeah, so something, you know, people, various people uh, use various techniques. Okay, so one thing I like about the quantum field theory is that you can see subfactor right away just from locality, and we of course know locality is is a fundamental principle um, in quantum field theory. So, so I want to just give you a flavor um, how you how you do this. Okay, so maybe I will be uh, let's let's just specialize to um, to uh, what's called a two D Cairo CFT. So let me describe uh, algebraic approach, algebraic approach. To uh, I would say Carroll to the CFT, okay. And to just emphasize, just to explain what's in the title, where does where do the subfactors come from? I will use locality to produce a lot of uh, subfactors, okay. So first, so um, so how 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 do um, people from algebraic quantum field theory think about um, Carroll to the CFT? So first of all, we have the circle. Okay, so to the Carroll, because we're talking about Carroll, so it's really on the uh, on the uh, uh, one-dimensional real line. But we're talking about conformal field theory, so we um, we include conformal boundary. We got the circle here, so that's the uh, that's the uh, um, the space time, if you wish, in this in this uh, in this case. And and what is the what is the algebraic approach to Carroll CFT? Well, the idea is that we're going to Take any interval of the circle, i, and then we think about 
all the observables which are localized on this interval i. You know, if you've never heard of that before, uh, never mind. It's just some assignment of algebras to interval of i. So for each i, we assign. Um, so algebras of observables localized i into i. Okay. Um, if you uh, if you have, uh, if your familiar language is the field rather than field rather than algebra, let me let me give you a rough picture of what this algebra of observables looks like. So if you have your field, let's say you are say you are field theory. Has a has a Lagrangian and it has a let's say has a, has some field let's say a scalar field for instance. So what is this algebra of observables? What do you mean by localized interval i? So one way to think about this is that so let's say z is the field. So how do I think of um, algebra of observables if I give him a bunch of fields? So what you do is you just smear this field with some function, test function. Okay, do some smearing of the circle. And what, all you require is that the support of this function, smeared function, is contained in this interval i. Okay? So outside this interval i, your field, you know, it sort of takes zero value, right? So anyway, so this is, so, so this way you generate some, so this is some um, operators. Okay? And then you just take, so ai is generated. By such operator. Okay, so I in this sentence, I mean, this has to be put in quotation mark. This, of course, for some people, for people who know something about constructed quantum theory, this is notoriously a uh, difficult thing. Um, when one issue is that this this mute uh, operator is always unbounded, and there, there are a lot of issues. But you know, in some cases, this can be uh, problem can be solved. So. We get algebras of observables localized as this interval i. Okay, all right. So, so the locality I want to talk about. So, locality is a very simple observation. So, so what is locality? It's really what you think it is. Okay. Locality is that if I take interval i here, let's take another interval. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Let Let me just draw one picture here. Yep, so I, I, let's take interval i like this. Okay, this is my interval i. Locality is the following. If I take another interval, so let's num number this i1. Let's number this um, i3 for what I'm going to do later on, okay? So for instance, this quarter of the interval. Locality is, is a very simple thing. Locality is that the observables localized on I1 commutes with the observables localized on I3. So um, AI1 commutes with AI3 if the intersection of I1 and I3 is empty set. Okay? So, I mean, I'm doing this in the, in the, in the Cairo case. So in general, in general, what happens if you if you have a, a, a causal domain, then you just uh, you just look at the two uh, space-like separated region, and you require that uh, the algebra of observables for one region commutes with uh, the algebra of observables, which is uh, localized on 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 a region which is time-like separated, uh, space-like separated from it. Okay, so this is the the Einstein lo uh, uh, locality. All right, so uh, let's assume that's, that's the case. And then I claim immediately we have subfactors. So immediately, in fact, this is a subfactor condition. So, so what this says is that, so let's write in in terms of a factor and, uh, and a subfactor. So this means that if I take a i3, if I take its commutant, okay, uh, yeah, it contains a i1, right? So this, is the subfactor coming from locality? Okay, so you see, um, so I can describe this locality condition as the existence of a subfactor. The algebra localized on I one is 
a subvector of the competent of algebra localized on I3 if I, I3 are spa is spatially like separated from I1, okay? So this is the, 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 uh, what I want to advertise here. So if you just have locality, you immediately produce um, lots of, uh, of subvectors, okay? So um, maybe I will finish with one thing, uh, and that's sort of tied up with an important notion in, um, in uh, um, uh, module the tensor category. Excuse okay. me, let me, let me just yeah. uh, uh, ask one more question. So why, yeah. why do you say that uh, if uh, I1 belong to I2, then AI1 is a sub-factor for AI2? Is that a Yes, here? absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. So Isotony is also true. Yes, that's okay. also true. Absolutely, yes. So, uh, yeah, the, there is a couple of uh, list of axioms, but I, because of time constraint, I just selected one that I thought is m most immediately related to sub-factor. You're absolutely right. So if I1 is containing an I2, and then AI1 is containing an I2. Uh, this, of course, is also a sub-factor. Unfortunately, it's not terribly interesting. So in these cases, it's always infinite index. Okay, so yeah, remember we have to get a finite index thing. So yeah, so that's why I, I didn't. So, so this is, so if I1 is containing an I2, of course, that's the case. Okay. But 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 you can see that uh, this if I one is containing sub interval of I two then then you know there's just this A I two is too big, okay. So um, the index is always infinite. So not okay. not uh, yeah 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 you're absolutely right. Yes, I, this, this is what's called isotony condition. Okay. You know the, based on this picture, this should be obviously true, right? Because if your quantum field theory is generated, let's say you have some kind of generating set of fields, then obviously this has to be true. Okay, but I want to produce some interesting finite index subfactor which will lead us to fusion category. Okay, so this is what I want to do next. All right, so um, yeah, um, so so um, here's here's the example. So here's the example of uh, a very what I call very interesting subfactor. So this let me just finish with this picture. So I got an I one here. That's the reason I labeled this because I thought I have this idea. But then let's do it again. So. I would divide my interval into four equal pieces. Okay, so I1 is the first quarter and I2 and I3 and the fourth. So, I'll, okay, I hope this picture is clear. So, let's consider the following subfactor. So, I take the phenomenon algebra, the observables localized on I1, I3, that, that is in the commutant of I2 and I4, right? As you can see, because uh, these two, uh, you know, you know, a, a space like separated, so we have locality. Okay, so this is this is a very interesting subfactor. So um, I call this Jones Westman subfactor. Uh, Jones himself called this multi interval subfactor. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so this is a let, very let me interesting ask a question here. Yeah, so here yeah. I one, I two, I three, I four are a closer uh, a closer set, right? Uh, no. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, uh, more precisely, it should be open set. But uh, in the um, so yeah, more precise should be open set. But um, in a nice situation, so they are, they are open. Open, I see. Yes, yes. But in a nice situation where where this net is known as strongly uh, additive, which is always the case in the most interesting cases, then it doesn't make a difference to say it's open interval, or closed interval. Yeah, I see. But, uh, so here is an open, it's open interval. That's all. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is an open interval. Yes. So. So this subfactor is extremely interesting, you know. Um, so I studied this uh, uh, many years ago, and, and uh, uh, in some some important examples. But later on, uh, a general structure theory was, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, discovered by uh, K L M. So K stands for Kawaigashi, Longo, and Muga. Um, the, um, so so the the result of K L M is the following. Okay, so um, so yeah, so uh, let me write down the result. The result is that, so let's denote this index. So denote this index by mu of a, okay? The KM result says that mu a is um, uh, the direct, uh, sorry, this is a sum of um, quantum dimension pi square. So pi is a uh, irreducible representation of, of my, uh, my uh, set of algebras. 
So I guess, yeah, I just realized I didn't, I defined the left-hand side, but I didn't quite define the right-hand side, okay? The right-hand side is, um, it's, um, so it's, so, so each of these net has, has uh, you can define its representation. You have an algebra, you can define its representation. And this representation has, uh, has an index like quantity, it's, it's uh, the quantum dimension. So this, this is literally the quantum dimension of the simple objects in your fusion category, okay? And if you take a square, you get exactly uh, this index for the Jones-Westman subfactor, okay? So I guess this is, um, this is uh, uh, I guess for people in, uh, in um, Major tensor category, this is known as global index, right? This is uh, the global index formula. These are the, you know, the, the dimensions, quantum dimension square of simple objects, simple, so pi are simple objects in the fusion category, okay? Um, this, of course, it's, it's extremely interesting, but now we, we, we see sort of a geometrically what this global index looks like, right? It's, it just comes from localities, okay? And this has a lot of interesting consequences. So maybe um, I will, uh, yeah. So so maybe I'll finish with one uh, last theorem. So this is a uh, this is a result I proved some time ago. Okay, so this is concerning the OB fold. Okay. So um, so let's say uh, G is finite group, and so acting let's say acting properly. Um, this A, so this, this net of observables, then you get the subnet like this. So uh, a fact is that- A G, what is A G? Yeah. Ah, A G is the, uh, uh, so those, let's write, let's write the A G here. A G, all those elements A in this net, so that, and the action of G is equal to self. Okay, it's invariant. Path. Yeah, okay. yeah, yes, it's the invariant path. So this is the so this is the usual obifold construction in conformal okay. in conformal field theory. So a nice fact about this is that if you if you take if you compute the global index of uh, the fixed point algebra, and notice that we got two interval here, it just follows from basic theory of subfactor that this global index is mu a, sorry, mu a times g square. Okay, it's important to have a square here. Um, because the reason we have square here, notice that we have two interval, I1 and I3. So each one of them contribute a factor of G, okay? So, so this, um, and in fact, uh, also prove that, uh, so, uh, so from this result, you immediately produce, uh, so, so if mu A is finite, then, um, then uh, this um, produce, lots of modular tensor category from A and G, right? So this is the, the obifold construction. And, and uh, um, so maybe I'll finish with one uh, example. Um, there are lots of such examples. So one, one of my favorite example is what's called the permutation obifold. It's completely general. So what you do is you take A tensor yourself n times, you take your favorite group, G, finite group, it's always embedded into uh, a subgroup of uh, permutation group of n letters. And then of course the action is just permuting the tensors. So then you, you just take the fixed point algebra of G, okay? So the representation category of this one produce, um, um, let's see, infinite families of modular tensor category from a given one. Okay. Anyway, so uh, I find this very interesting because, you know, for instance, if you take G to be the cyclic group, you can use this fact to, to show that if you, have, uh, if you have a fusion category coming from the representation of this uh, net, then it satisfies the congruent subgroup property. Okay. So of course, Richard, uh, Proved this in more general setting when A is just a fusion category. Right? It's a modular tensor category. So, so but anyway, so this is, um, yeah, so what I'm saying is that there's, there's a lot of overlap um, uh, between this subject and, um, and um, you know, modular tensor category, you know, representation theory and so forth. 
Um, I think each each approach. So, I mean, many of the tools are different, but I think um, uh, each has its own advantage. Um, as you can see, global index in the case of net is is very. I mean, you can see this very easily, right? Just from the locality. So, yeah. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, it's great. Uh, I think uh, I do have questions, so maybe I will ask yeah. first. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there's a difference between the representation category of a single, you know, factor and versus the local conformable net. So, in the local conformable net, you know, instead of a, a fusion category, you do get a modular tensor category. Yes, yes. So, right. the, where's the braiding? Braiding in the case of local conformal net. Yeah, yeah. So in the oh, early okay. case, you know, you don't get a braided category. Yes, you just yes, get a yes, yes. That, that's yeah. a very good question. Yes. So what's yes, the new? Yes. Where's the? Maybe I will yes. ask the second question. Just you can answer both afterwards. So, the okay. second question is completely unrelated. Can you give like a very short education on three one factors because that's what they come from. So ah, from the three one factor. Right? So uh, yeah, the three one factor is the easy one. So okay. so you can uh, answer either. yeah. Take your favorite conformal field theory or chiral conformal field theory. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so it's a general structure result that this is always type three one factor. Okay, but uh, my yeah. question is, uh, can you give us you know quick summary of you know how do we extend three one from two one or two infinity, whatever? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's do this here. So You're three. Right. So, yeah, three. So, so the, all this AI one. So. Is a general fact that all these lo local observable algebras that are coming from quantum field theory. So this is completely general, not just spe specific to conformal field theory. That they all types three one factors. So these are all types three factors. So what's the difference between types three one factors and type two one, or type two infinity? Well, uh, the important thing is. So maybe I will just state one striking fact about type three one factors. Okay. So type three factors. Um, so. Um, so if you take any projection P, so P is a projection in AI, um, then you can always find uh, an isometry V in AI, such that um, uh, V implements um, the equivalence between this projection and ident identity. So isometry means V star V is equal to identity, but V V star is equal to this projection P. Okay, so this is what, what characterizes type three factors. So, so let's see why this is different from two one factor. I will, I will see. So, if M is two one, and let's say we have a a symmetry which, which does this equal the projection, then if I take the trace of P, I will get trace V V star. Of course, trace is cyclic, so this is trace V star V. Therefore, it's equal to one, right? Because trace identity is equal to one, so in that case, we know if if your trace of projection is equal to one, this means that p has to be equal to identity. Okay, because trace is phase form. Okay, so so this means that it would never happen in the type two one factor because type two one factor has a trace. This trace somehow restrict such possibility. Okay, so in fact, in type two one factor, two projections are equivalent if and only if they have the same trace. Okay, so. But in the type three factors, this any two projections, any two non-zero projection, I should say, uh, p not zero, any two non-zero projection are equivalent. Okay, so type three factors are known with something known as properly infinite. It's really infinite. So maybe I, I will I will state one striking fact about this. Previously, we have discussed about the left uh, n module, right? In the type two one case, they're given by the this dimension quantity, right? So here is a fact which hopefully may also answer the next question. So here's the fact. So let's say we have AI. So all left AI module, non-zero, I, I should assume, are unitary equivalent. Okay, so AI is type three factor. So this is very different from type two one factor. In the case of type, type two one factor, because of the existence of that trace, we know it's classified by the dimension. But for type three factors, if you take its left module, they're all unitary equivalent. In other words, you take your favorite left module 
over type 3 rim factor. Your roommate take another one. There's always a unitary map between these two Hilbert spaces, which intertwine the action of this type 2 rim factor. So in other words, sorry, type 3 factor. So in other words, the, rep, the, the left module theory of type 3 factor, let's just write this, is trivial. There's nothing interesting about it. Okay. Okay, so this is this is due to the proper infiniteness of our underlying algebra. So in this case, the, the, you know, uh, I know some of you might 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 not uh, you know may not I, uh, like the infinite dimensional cases, but you know this is where the infinite dimensional purely infinite thing is really really useful because you know some of the theory like the, this module theory is trivial. There, there's only one unitary equivalence class. Okay. All right, so why is this re related to, uh, you know, what Jing Han asked about the braiding? You know, how do you get the braiding in this case? Okay, so let me, let me describe the braiding here using this fact. So, so suppose I have two representations, pi 1, pi 2 representations. Ah, so let's start with one representation first. So let's start with the pi representation of this, of this net, right? So, so what does this mean? Remember, this is, this is a collection of algebras, one for each interval of the circle, right? So this means that I have pi i representations of a i. So this is a collection of representation, okay? Now, so here's, here's a very useful trick called the localization trick, okay? The trick is the following. So let's fix the interval i fix one particular interval i, maybe I'll, yeah, let's denote by i zero. So let's just pick, fix one. Then you can see because this, this is a representation of ai, so representation of ai is the same as the left a module, okay? So, so if I fix pi i zero, because what I said before, pi i zero is unitarily equivalent to the representation of ai zero on itself, right? Right, the, the, the defining one, okay? I have some rep, new representation, so this is associated to some new representation. You, some people call this super selection sectors and so forth. So if you choose any other representation, if you fix the interval i, okay? This representation globally might be different, but if you just fix one interval, fixed interval, then this representation is the trivial representation, is the what's called the vacuum representation of AI zero. Okay, so, so now what I can do is, is, is the following trick. So what I can do is that we, we're going to just identify pi i zero with this trivial representation. In other words, I just, you know, I use this unitary equivalence to identify pi i zero with the, with the vacuum representation, the, the trivial one, okay? Once I identify this, let's look at, so this is, uh, this is the picture. So the upper half, the upper half circle is I zero. The lower half circle, let's denote by I zero complement. Okay. Now let's look at what happens pi I zero. So, so, so uh, let's see what, what, uh, yeah. So in other words, pi I zero, uh, a is equal to A for any A in AI zero, right? This is identification. So this representation, if I fix the interval I zero on the upper half plane, for instance, I zero, I can make sure that this representation, if you restrict to the upper half plane, is the trivial representation, okay? So that's called localization. I can, you know, um, so, so, on I zero is trivial. So the only thing non-trivial is, uh, is in the lower half plane, right? So, so pi I zero complement on A I zero contains crucial information, contains all the information about this representation pi, okay? So this is, this is because of the type three nature of things. We can do such localization. Anytime you have a representation, you fix any interval you like, you can always localize your representation um, in its complement, in the sense that if you restrict representation to I zero, it's trivial. 
but only thing non-trivial happens when you go to the complement. Okay, so this is a localization, and this would help us to explain what's braiding. What is braiding? Well, braiding in the fusion category is that you got two representations of your net. Then there is a there is a relation between pi one tensor pi two and pi two tensor pi one, right? That's that's the braiding which exchange these two representations. And in this case, uh, the idea is pretty simple. So what you do, okay? You choose just choose two interval i one i two. You localize your representation pi one to i one. You localize your representation pi two to i two. Remember, each time you do localization, you actually multiply by unitary, right? But once you localize, this one is localized on i one, so it only does something non-trivial on i one. This one is localized on i two, only does something non-trivial on i two. Then you can see that pi one composed with i pi two is the same as this pi two times composed with pi one, okay? Trivially, because they have different support, okay? So this leads to braiding. So braiding is a consequence of, of the fact you have type three factor and you have locality, okay? So I, I write this like this, you, look, you might think this braiding is trivial. No, because I, when I do this trivialization, I have those conjugates of unitary. So braidings, you can, you can write it explicitly as some kind of uh, multiplication of those unitaries where you, you, you choose for your localization, okay? And one can check by just using the geometry here that this braiding satisfy the usual young backs equation and uh, breeding fusion relation and so forth. So all the axioms of, uh, of uh, modular tensor category follow directly from this geometric picture. Oh, thanks. This is great. I think I Thank know you very much. why there's a braiding. <laughs> So well, I think I have a... I also explain something else, actually. That's also kind of answer my question, which is why this is a chiral, because you can always trivialize the top circle. Uh -huh. So it's only the bottom circles. So it's not a double, so it's a chiral theory. Yes, yes, that's right, yes. So I also have a question. Uh, you, uh, you have this uh, uh, algebra AI in the kind of abstractly, and uh, whether there's some example, you know, yes, what, yes, what, absolutely. what AI looks like. So, so the, yes, this, yes, I absolutely. imagine this is a conformal net a formulation, yes. conformal field theory. Yes, so, yes. So, so how, how one yes. so, gives So maybe I, I will take the example I already used, right? I think uh, Xiaogang, you, uh, you're probably yeah. familiar with this, right? So, okay, yeah. so let's take this. So uh, from this, we can produce a conformal net. So how do we con okay. produce conformal net? So, 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 um, so we need, we, so a little bit of representation theory. So what we do is, what, what, what we do is we take what's called a loop group. So okay. LSU2, yeah. So these are the uh, smooth maps from the circle to SU2. Okay. So this is a group. Um, and then, uh, and then um, so the conformal net is constructed by taking uh, what's called the a uh, positive energy, well, projective, positive energy representation of LSU2, okay? Um, this is a, this is well uh, defined on, on, this is this is a well-studied subject. So um, I, on, the, on the Lie algebra level, this is what's called the uh, Kasmudi algebra. Okay. Yeah, the, 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 the dominant uh, weight uh, positive energy representation of Kasmudi algebra. So, so in that case, let me, let me show you what this AI is. So if yeah. I fix <laughs> interval I in the circle, this AI is just uh, um, the algebra, the von Neumann algebra actually, generated by loops supported On interval i. Okay, so in other words, you take those smooth maps, but uh, it's supported on interval i. In other words, on the complement of i, uh, those elements oh, take identity element. Yeah. Oh, just a map because, or just identity. Okay. Yes. Yes. I see. So this is the phenomenon, or or using the double commutant theorem, this is just uh, the double commutant of those loops. Okay. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So so this is an example. In mm. fact, this this works for all the WZW model, right? 
if you if you take your favorite uh, yeah, group, yeah. You, so so this way you produce a lot of examples. Yeah. This would correspond to people uh, familiar with quantum group. This is the, just the yeah. UQG, right? UQG thing. So Q will take the roots of unity. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Sorry. Just quick question about the, your terminology. So when you say generated by loops supported in I, so I understand that probably means a map from the circle to this, uh, you know, this thing. But then yes. what's the yeah. what's the Hilbert space? What's the the algebra? Ah, the, so so yes, yeah, so 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 this is a representation, right? So so yeah. this representation are represented on some Hilbert space. Okay, oh, so okay, so, okay, yeah, I see. yeah. So, so they're that, represented. That, that, yeah, Hilbert, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So everything happens on this. Uh, some you know, if you take a representation of this loop okay. group, and okay, then everything happens on that. So so you have Hilbert space. You have unitary operators. You okay. so this this local observable algebra. In this case, you can see that it also fits what I. What I said before, I said you, if you take your favorite example and your favorite field, you can just generate this this algebra, right? This this is way up way up here. So mm -hmm. in this case, the field is just a current. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just a cosmodic current, the 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 current algebra. So if you take the current algebra, just smeared with functions supporting the I, that's exactly the loop group uh, uh, algebra element. Let's see. Okay. So there's a, a, from physical point of view, this example is a little bit special because it is kind of purely chiral. Means yeah. that uh, it don't have a, a lattice realization. Means, uh, you know, uh, what I try to say is that uh, usually in physics, one can discretize your circle, make a circle to be many, many points. Yeah. And each point has a finite dimensional vector space. Then you take a limit where point number go to infinity. Yeah. And, uh, so, so, so this is what we discussed in the last week. So whether this uh, algebra have a, ha, is a limit of some kind of finite dimensional algebra. <laughs> oh, these are all, so this, uh, yeah, yeah, this these is all one way. So, oh, yeah, I so see. AI all hyperfinite. Okay. Yeah, so there's an increase in so sequence. Yeah, they're okay. all hyperfinite. So, yeah, so uh, I think that the point of view is that uh, you know, uh, they're hyperfinite by general argument, but uh, it's very hard to actually produce a concrete finite dimensional uh, sequence of algebras which approximate AI. We know it exists, but uh, you know, see. there's no canonical choice. So this is I what see. I said before. You know, um, those of us who occasionally, you know, think about, you know, using the lattices to approximate these things, yeah. uh, always run into a lot of technical problems. Yeah, yeah. Because the choices are never, never sort of unique. So that's sometimes why I like to work directly on this continuum limit. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, where yeah. everything seems to be, you know, the geometric interpretation of all familiar operations. You, you name it, everything. I mean, I just said a few things, but you name it. It's all in this circle, in this picture. Okay. You know, there's a physics motivation for this construction or for this limit. That is, a, a, the, your real circle as a boundary of a disk. Then you should put a, a topological quantum field theory on the disk. Then you can get this chiral algebra. That seems, uh, at least from, uh, from what we understand, this may be most natural way to produce this chiral algebra. Ah, you mean you mean using uh, the the Chen Simon's functional? Yeah, using Chen Simon's. And then and then, uh, and then on the boundary. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so to yeah. directly produce this on the boundary from finite dimensional point of view may be difficult, but uh, view boundary as a disk. Have transformation theory on the disk, then that yeah, yeah, that absolutely. seems more, more natural. That seems more natural. Yes, 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 yes. That's in fact that that's uh, that's uh, that's sorry, that's that's uh, Ed Witten's stuff, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. But but I'm confused by what you said about AI hyperfinite. I thought we already you told us that in quantum field theory you always type three. Yes, but type uh, three can still be hyperfinite. Hyperfinite type three. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> type okay. three. Yeah. So yeah. So so so. In other words, it's the same definition as before. You can find a, a, a sequence, increasing sequence of fine dimensional algebras which approximate any element here. Um, uh, you know, weakly. Yes. Okay. But but just you know, mathematically means hyperfinite can be a type two or can be type three. Both yes. 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 That's right. Yes. Uh, yeah. So. Is there some canonical way to convert or maybe always a type three factor from a type two one or type two infinity? Uh, let's see. Um, 
Yes, yes. Uh, so so uh, Takisaki has a duality theorem, which mm -hmm. says that if you if you take um, type three factors, if you do a cross product, it's always mm -hmm. embedded into a type two infinity factor. Okay. Yeah, so there's some structure results in that. Yeah, since, since uh, Zheng Han, you mentioned this, so maybe I also mention one thing which might be interesting to you guys. Okay, sure. That is that all these hyperfinite, uh, so these observable algebras, when you, when you uh, restrict the interval i, they're all hyperfinite, they're all isomorphic. Okay. So this is a, a very important, this is, a, I think, a result of Kong and um, uh, Hockerup. So all the hyperfinite type 3, 1 factors are isomorphic. So in other words, mm -hmm. if you just look at the algebra restricted to an interval i, there's no information there. They all look similar, they look exactly the same. All quantum field theory look exactly the same. So it doesn't matter which interval. group, whether yeah, it move. doesn't matter which group you take, okay? Oh, my so goodness. What, what's non-trivial here? What's non-trivial? So what, what's the point here? Well, the point here is that, so the non-trivial information, let's write it down which I think it's, it's quite interesting. So the non-trivial information about this AI and uh, the representations are contained in the way this AI are patched together. on the circle, okay? So this is, this is so what, what I think is quite amazing fact. This is just <laughs> like Hilbert, all the Hilbert spaces, right? All, I mean, several Hilbert spaces are isomorphic, right? But there's still a lot of interest in quantum mechanics, right? So what I'm saying here is that this way, algebraic quantum field theory approach is that if you, if you just fix the interval i and look at the observables on that interval i, look at the algebraic type, you get no information, nothing at all, okay? The non-trivial information, the dynamics of the of the model you have is is contained in a way these algebras how they patch together. Remember, they have to satisfy those conditions. They have to be isotony, right? They have to satisfy locality. So those conditions distinguish them. You know, distinguish one model from another one. <laughs> well, it also says something which we already know. So. Quantum field theory is about topology, nothing to do with the local geometry. So, <laughs> that's we all know this for, yeah, that's yeah, why yeah, I've been so, interested yeah. for 30 years. Yeah, that's true, that's true. That's true. Topology. Oh. Locally, the all skip space, yeah. yes. That's I right. do have a comment about the question I ask you. Uh, so I always kind of surprised to, to when people say this, which is, oh, uh, if you want to do quantum field theory, you have to use type three factors. Yes. And I also know that type two one factors ever, you know, since, you know, Juan Jones, we know it's uh, statistical mechanics. Yes. And we also know in physics, there is a connection between statistical mechanics and the quantum field theory. So that's <laughs> it. There has to be a canonical way to connect two one factors at type, well, there's a canonical way to connect type two one and the type three factors because Physicists always says, oh, uh, there's a connection in D dimension statistical mechanics with uh, D minus one plus one dimension quantum field theory. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that, that, we, that I also heard too. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. One thing I guess, one, one thing I can say is that, um, so, so, you know, we have a lot of examples of type three one um, sub factor coming out of this, right? But th there's a theorem due to POPA Mm -hmm. which says the following. So uh, let's take uh, one of the sub-factors, the ones I just described, right? So I have, uh, I have some type three, let's say type three, one. For instance, the Jones sub-factor. So let's say N in M. Okay, so this is all. Way, type three, how do you classify type three, one, type three, infinity, that's all? Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a type three, one. This is the one that's most relevant to quantum uh, theory. There is type three, lambda, where lambda is, uh, between zero and less equal to one. Uh, uh, well, let's see, not equal to one. So this is a related to ecotic theory. Okay. So, yeah, so there's a more, more related to probability and dynamical system. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and also there's type three zero, sorry, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, so, but, but this is related to quantum field theory. Okay. okay. This, is, this result is actually a very old result. So um, I think it's some German whose name I forgot and back in the 60s. So what he proved is that just under the condition of positive energy, then it's all type three one. 
it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's not a difficult proof. But anyway, so Popov's result says the following. So back to type three one, type two one case. So if I got type three one factor like this, which is a finite depth, then Popov proved that, proved that. So in in the example I described, then um, you can always Popov show that this you can always write this sub factor as n one tends with a common hyperfinite type three one factor, m one tends to r. So this is this r is hyperfinite type three one where N1, M1 is a two one factor. Oh, I see, okay, that's, that's yeah. what well, I some, like actually. Yeah, in, in some way, some way they just split out a common type three one factor. So this sort of explained the connection between the original, I mean the original, cons I mean, the original work of Jones was on two one factor, right? Mm -hmm. But now in quantum field theory, we have the type three one situation. So what Popa proved is that you can always, you know, these two are closely related. Okay, but unfortunately Popa's proof you can never find this R explicitly, so that's <laughs> so this backs to the to the problem of you you know those approximations and and working directly on the on the continuum. There's no canonical choice of this R. But also that means there are many different hyperfinite three type three factors. No, no, no. All the types of factors are isomorphic. Okay, so it's just the, it's the, the same, same R, just in different forms. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. That's amazing. So, yeah. so here you consider this loop group, and uh, that seems to give you one of Carroll theory. Yeah. And uh, now, can you generalize to the sphere group? <laughs> ah, the sphere group. Unfortunately, uh, as you know, the the gauge group, right? The current current algebra. Um, yeah. I think it is only in the in the lower dimension case has uh, has non true has has interesting positive energy representation. If you yeah. If you generalize to high dimensions, the gauge group doesn't have positive energy representation. So in fact, in high dimensional case, we don't know what the right observable algebra is. Yeah. The, the reason I ask is because uh, you emphasize the locality. Yeah. You emphasize that on the patch things are trivial, only how they connect it is yes. uh, important. Yes. And uh, those kind of feature may survive, uh, may play a key role in higher dimension. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree, I agree. A great yes. example. Yes, yes. You see, uh, the, we, we have this uh, embarrassing thing here. <laughs> Let me admit it, okay? So, you know, I've been, I've been studying quantum field theory for quite some time. Um, the reason, you know, we, we all get excited about this Cairo CFD is not because, you know, well, I guess because of ability, uh, that because in other dimensions, the only examples, the, the mathematically well-defined examples are more or less free series. Or generalized yeah. <laughs> free theories. So, okay. if you if you want to uh, publish a mathematical theorem, then you know uh, you state that in your high dimensions. In fact, one time I was at a seminar, some you know a highly influential person was just asking, "What are the examples?" You know, so your theorem in high dimensions would be just a free theory, you know, for which we already know know the answer. So, so uh, I think one thing I, I'm excited about this is because there's no shortage of examples. In fact, there's, okay. there's as many as examples as you can get. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I like to. I really like to understand high dimensional case better. But uh, so far, um, yeah. Yeah, I can only say that in higher dimension, if you discretize uh, uh, the space, then there's a lot of example. But uh, how to take a limit uh, uh, to see there's some interesting limit is a uh, is a uh, I don't I, I I don't know yeah so actually yeah, that's but, why but I, I thought I thought, I thought you to... yeah I thought you might know more because physicists have this amazing ability to pick up the interesting uh, limit <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's my impression and for instance in the S Y K model I mean they they they, they do this kind of uh, limit and then you know claim that yeah. the limit would be the interesting one. So I find that quite amazing, you know. Yeah, this, uh, uh, yeah, so in physics, we do have a lot of a higher dimensional example. Yeah. But uh, those examples are constructed on the lattice, so on, on the discrete I space. I see. And then yeah. the, the certainly interesting is to happen in a continuum limit, you're taking the limit. So actually that's why I'm kind of asking you this uh, discrete, uh, discretization of your formulation. 
uh, because uh, understanding that uh, these, uh, these, this kind of discretization probably can generalize to higher dimension. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yes, so like so I said, for, for example, your AI, this I can be, basically you can discredit your circle into many, many points. And then, yeah. this, uh, then the AI became finite dimensional algebra, but they all have a, but the, the, the relation, you, uh, the condition you propose, they all apply to this case. And yes. then you take a limit of this, uh, this lattice model, and uh, then some magic appears. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, in fact, I think I think uh, planar algebra, for instance, is one approach which tries mm. to do that. So, so planar algebra, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so Jones has this picture of a uh, discrete uh, ties this uh, circle, and and uh, you know, um, I think he he worked on this at least uh, maybe the last uh, maybe two uh, years ago. Yeah. So there's some result in that direction. He made contact with the lattice models and statistics mechanics. Yes. Mm, but um, but but one thing one thing what's interesting is that you see uh, I didn't mention the conformal group so in this case it would be the diffeomorphism group of the circle. Yes. So in, in interesting conformal field theory you get I mean the the, the Lie algebra would be Versorel algebra right so you get mm. an of Versorel okay. algebra. So one one question people have been asking is how do you see the discrete analog of Versorel algebra? Um, and mm. uh, and it seems to, I mean, I, I have followed that for a while and, and, and uh, well, there are a lot of confusions and, and, and yeah. you know, I don't know what, what's the current status of that. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, so, uh, yeah. Okay, I think I, I can say one thing, which is I believe the question probably can be answered pretty soon. So, ah, okay, okay. So That's there's, a, there's a beautiful paper, I believe just posted maybe a month ago uh, by Seller. So I think I see ah, okay. it's the famous co seller formula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Seller. Yes, yes. So uh, the, you know, I work on this with my student, David. So there's the co seller uh -huh. formula. Sorry, I need to turn off some red phone. So uh, we all know there's a, there's a mistake in a sense uh, that the co seller formula on the lattice, it does not converge to the Vera Soro uh, uh -huh. thing. And there's a mistake for sure. Uh, uh -huh. If we believe statistical mechanics, we believe physics, uh, which I, I definitely believe something. And uh, recently they posted a new paper, uh, which is, I think uh, it could be philosophically and fundamentally very important, which is if you write down the lattice version of the higher, there's no trouble to get the lower one, the SL2C, you can always get it. Mm -hmm. The question is the higher uh, we are sort of general LN. Yeah. And they put down the discrete formula. And the mm -hmm. claim is they do converge to the correct one by using the Kusler formula. But mm -hmm. the simple charge is an extra piece of information you won't be able to get from the uh, discrete lattice. Mm -hmm. So that's the conclusion they get from a numerical simulation. I and see. I believe that actually, actually this will be the answer to the question, which is you could write down a discrete version of the Virasoro generator LN for n bigger than one, but okay. you will never get the central charge correctly. That's some extra information you need from the lattice. So I, see. So I think- So, so, so this, this LN uh, I've written as, uh, as uh, some kind of uh, bilinear form of the, uh, of the temple leap elements in the temple yeah, leap elements. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. It's a, it's some template. Well, you know, I wrote out better formula, but turns out it's only better for computer simulation, no, not better mm -hmm. for analytic results. So, okay. So I, I think this, uh, this question should be able to be answered pretty soon uh, by, you know, this small insight that which was important, which is the lattice probably does not contain the information of the central charge. Ah. Okay. Yeah, keeping me informed. So yeah, anyway, this is one thing I actually I'd be, you know, really interested in this. I think uh, I think now I, I I was thinking the Kusler formula is fundamentally wrong, but now I believe actually it's uh, more or less correct. Okay. <laughs> Okay, guys, so maybe it's time to let the phone go. This is incredible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
to okay. get some flavor. So you will see. Yeah, now we. Oh, right. <laughs> well, actually, before I let you go, one more quick question. So you mentioned that uh, for higher lead group, there are no interesting positive energy representations. They we don't know, or you can prove they don't exist. No, we can prove they don't exist. Okay, so it's a data. Oh, well, yeah. So so yeah. So so there are no high. Uh, there are no interesting high dimensional current algebra. So that's that's the conclusion. Yeah. Okay.